Lockhart and I am the Community Engagement Specialist for Resources. And this is day one of our Beach Stewards training um, being hosted by North Sound Stewards. Um, even though it says North Sound Stewards, it is open to the public. So if you are not a steward, that's okay. Um, for those of you who might not be in the program, North Sound Stewards is a community science program. It's jointly run between resources and the Whatcom Marine Resource Committee. And every year we get together and we train Whatcom County residents um, who then take that training and go out and monitor our beaches and our waterways and collect data um, and just collect information that isn't always captured by government agencies. So they are providing a really valuable service. Um, so you're gonna be hearing from several folks from resources in the MRC today. Um, yeah, and if you're not already in that project or in that program, I would really encourage you to join. The applications are closed this year, but they open up at the end of every year and we accept everybody that applies. So if you're interested in doing more projects like this, then you can join us next year. Um, so for the agenda, this is going to be a two day or excuse me, a three part training broken up over a couple of days. So this is part one. Um, there's going to be two virtual trainings. So this is the first of the two virtual trainings. Um, the second one's going to be on May 10th. And then we're going to have a weekend where we're going to try and get folks out on the beach to um, practice what they've learned with all their peers. So if you're not able to make the trainings, these are going to be recorded. Um, so if you weren't able to attend this one, or if you're not able to attend the one next week, that's okay. You will be provided the recording. Um, we are gonna check in with folks individually. We do wanna make sure that we get you out on the beach before we like send you off into the public. So if you're not able to make those dates, um, if you already know that ahead of time, then just let us know and we can try and work something out. Um, but today for day one, we're gonna be going over an introduction to the program. Um, you're gonna hear from Alex, who's gonna go over tides and an intertidal zone one on, uh, 101. We'll have a quick break and then I will go over beach etiquette and then you're gonna get some species ID part one, um, and then we'll do just wrap up and any final questions um, before moving on. All right, and there are enough of us here, or I should say so few of us here that I think I want us to introduce ourselves um, with our cameras on, or at least audio, we can, like we have, we have plenty of time, we have two hours, so we can kind of get to know each other. These are gonna be the people that you're working with. So you are welcome to turn on your cameras um, and I can just call on folks. And if you wanna just give us your name, um, your favorite sea critter or mammal and why either you're excited to join Beach Stewards or a question that you have or something that you're hoping that we'll cover or anything at all you wanna share where you're calling in from, all of that. So I will go ahead and start with Alex cause you are in the top of my corner. So Alex, go ahead. Hi, my name is Alex, that's short for Glenn Alexander, and I am a member of the Marine Resource Committee. You'll hear it referred to as the MRC. Favorite sea critter uh, for years, my favorite has been a caprellid, which is a very small animal, uh, maybe up to about an inch. It's a type of amphipod, and they look kind of like a walking stick or a praying mantis. And, and that's, and it's just exciting for me when I find them. Uh, why I'm, ex I'm excited about uh, the beach stewards because I'm hoping that we'll have a, a great opportunity for us to volunteer, to be on the beach and, and to do good and also to help the animals that live there. That's awesome. Okay, and we'll hear from Eleanor. Hi, I'm Eleanor Hines. I'm the North Sound Beekeeper Lead Scientist at Resources, and I'll be one of the trainers along with Alex, Destiny, Rondi, and Austin. And um, I also am on the Wacom Marine Resources Committee as well, so sometimes I wear more than one hat. <laughs> um, and my favorite sea critter or mammal, there are so many good ones to pick from, but I'm gonna go with the nudibranch right now because they're really fun to watch. Um, and I would love to tell you the story about the first one I ever came across because I had no idea what it was when I first saw it, um, but story for another time. Um, and I'm super excited about Beach Stewards because this is a program um, that I did through Surfrider several years ago at Larrabee State Park with a lot of success. And I know um, resources and the MRC also did this um, several years ago to the beach naturalists and um, had a lot of success with it too. And um, it seems like a good time for it with COVID and 
um, so many people getting outside and there are some really, really great low tides this summer. So I'm excited for all the negative three foot tides this summer. So uh, that's all I have for now. Great, thanks. And let's hear from Rondi. Hi, I'm Rondi. I'm the Aquatic Reserves Coordinator, coordinator here at Resources. Um, it's a program coordinated in part by the Washington Service Corps. Um, I use she, her pronouns. One of my favorite sea critters would probably be the bay pipe fish. It's kind of a really skinny tube fish that's related to the seahorse. Um, and you can often find it in areas with a lot of eelgrass. It's the color blends in really well with it. So it has really great camouflage, um, but they're really fun. Um, and I'm excited to join Beach Stewards um, just because I think it's a really great program um, and I see a lot of value in it. All right. Now, I'm not seeing the names on the on the screens here, so I'm just going to go off of the list. So we're going to go with Joyce. Hi, um, I'm Joyce Stippold and I live in Birch Bay and I've um, been a volunteer at Birch Bay State Park uh, doing beach walks, assisting the uh, naturalists. And I really enjoy it. It's something that um, my daughter got me interested in her degrees in marine biology. Unfortunately, she's not using it. She's doing um, computer stuff for the Department of Navy. But um, I have participated with different folks, watched their excitement as they pick up the little rock crabs and, and um, play with them in their hands. But my favorite creature um, is a chitin just because they look so prehistoric. I get such a kick out of them and they cling so tightly to the rocks. Um, I'm really new to this, so I'm looking forward to learning as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's hear from Anne. Hi, sorry, my video isn't working right now. Um, All right. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say, hmm, yeah, there are lots of great critters, but I think sea cucumbers are pretty interesting. They look like they don't do anything, but I'm sure they do a lot. That's important. <laughs> so, um, and I'm excited uh, to join Beach Stewards just because I think it's neat to teach um, as much as possible about what's going on in that uh, ecosystem because there's so much. All right, thank you. Um, and Casey. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Casey and um, gosh, probably my favorite, I'm gonna go classic whales just because like all whales, I just love how social they are. I love their like behaviors and just like habits and it's interesting too. Um, they're just interesting. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really excited to do this program. I am currently doing salmon restoration work. And so I'm sort of getting more of like the river side of things in my work life, but I, want to work more on like um, learning what's on the beach, um, just learning all the different species and how to educate people better um, and know what's around me more and yeah, share that with the world and the community. All right, thank you. Um, and let's hear from Catherine. Uh, <clears throat> hi, I'm Catherine Allen. I'm still fairly new to Bellingham. I moved here from the banks of the Mississippi River where I did a lot of work with the Sierra Club uh, to care for the waterfront of the Mississippi and also many of the feeder streams that uh, flowed into the Mississippi. And I'm here to learn. I'm um, really looking forward to learning more about the creatures that dwell near us. But I have to say of my favorites at this time, it would probably be the octopus, although I don't suspect we'll run into those <laughs> on the beach. But um, there have been so many wonderful things about the uh, intelligence and how they octopuses relate even to humans. So I'm quite taken with that right now. All right, and Lucy. Hello, my name is Lucy. Um, my favorite sea critter is not localized to around here, but I really like the mantis shrimp. Um, I just think they're fascinating. And I'm excited to join the beach stewards kind of selfishly because I really enjoy going to low tides and I want to be able to like identify what's out there better, but I'm also excited to like help teach other people as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Okay. And Noreen. 
I've got three screens going, so I'm not sure any of this is working. I don't know if you can see me right now. I don't have a gallery view on, um, but uh, it's Noreen Fujita Sacco. I would say what I'm working on the most right now would be the Orcas. I just helped with a ceremony that our fellowship did to support Lummi Nation and their efforts to bring Takatai home. Um, so orcas very definitely are, are a favorite mammal of mine that I'm supporting. I have taken a break from doing volunteer work with wildlife and I'm really looking in looking forward to getting back into that so I can refresh any knowledge that that I had and supplement that. I especially like getting other people interested um, in things that are going on on the beach because once they're interested they'll support those animals and plants and will work on ways that they can be least detrimental on their footprint on the planet. Yeah, thank you. Um, and let's hear from Shannon. Hi, my name is Shannon and um, my favorite sea creature, although I don't believe there are any locally, is the seahorse. And I'm a lifelong resident of Birch Bay, Washington. And although I think I know a lot about our beaches, I also think I probably could learn a lot more. So I'm excited to be here. And I also have my friend Jana here with me. Hi, Jana Turner. And uh, Shannon was expressing some interest and in, I said, hey, we're gonna be getting together and doing this. And I work with friends at Birch Bay State Park and Joyce and I have been, for the past seven years on the beaches at the state park and really need people to talk to people about clamming and clam, uh, covering up their clam holes and uh, kind of identifying the clams for the people. And just when you see people walking away with bags of sea uh, shells, you kind of are like, hey. And so I'm looking forward to this. Um, all these different sea creatures are some of my favorites. And I would have to say um, this, Sperm whale was one that I had an encounter with, with uh, when I was in Alaska and just saw his big blue eye look up at me and I was talking to him. And so I have a connection with all whales, but that sperm whale really captured me. So thank you. So, well, nice to have both of you. And last but not least, let's hear from Sophie. Hi, um, I'm Sophie. My favorite sea creatures are the Pacific Spiny Love Sucker, the Gumboot Chitin, and the Monterey uh, Sea Slug. I can't really choose between any of them. Um, I'm excited to join Beach Stewards because I am really needing to work on my people skills after the pandemic and like brush up on my teaching. And I'm also super passionate about uh, environmental education and conservation. And I feel like the best way to get kids interested in our tide pools is to have them play in them and understand them one on one. So yeah. All right, great. Awesome. Okay, so I think that that's everybody. I don't think that I missed everyone. Perfect. Okay, awesome. Well, really nice to meet you all. And I'm happy that you're all so excited about this program. Um, and you guys will be seeing much more of each other in person. So that'll be nice. Nice that we're starting to move in person and get some like actual human interaction. Um, Okay, so next, um, we're going to talk about like why Beach Stewards, why does this program exist? Um, as Eleanor mentioned before, Beach Stewards was a program that was originally um, imagined as beach naturalists a couple years ago. Um, and that started with resources in the MRC a while back, and then that kind of died down and was picked up by the Northwest Straits Surf Rider chapter. Um, and that ran for several years at Larrabee State Park. Um, and it was successful and it was so successful, not necessarily just because of that, but it was so successful that it actually died down because the need was no longer there. Um, the water quality improved, which is great. If we can get put out of business, out of the business of keeping our waters clean, and that is excellent. Um, but the need has returned again. So beach stewards are, we act as beach interpreters um, and an educational resource for beach goers. Um, and we're doing that because we currently are loving our beaches to death when we bring out our pets, when we're all um, rushing out in the, uh, as masses to the beach, generating litter, pet waste, um, 
you know, just leaving such a heavy footprint on our beaches. Um, we're kind of loving them to death. So we do want to just make sure that we're taking care of it and stewarding it, especially with the pandemic. Um, lots of people are rushing out. They really want to get outdoors. They've been cooped up. Um, so especially this summer and next summer, as well as all of the low tides that we're having, we're um, expecting a lot of a lot of action over these next two summers and a lot of foot traffic. So we just want to make sure that we are out there and encouraging people to love our beaches and not love them to death. And also this was specifically requested by Larrabee State Park and Birch Bay State Park. So those are going to be the two parks that we are working in this year. Um, maybe in the following years, we will expand that. Um, so now a bit about our goals and expectations. So at the end of this training, you will be able to do simple beach interpretation, um, ID, local, low tide organisms. And you're going to be educating beach goers on proper beach etiquette, um, talking about water quality bacteria and what folks can do to help keep our beaches clean. Um, so that is essentially what we're doing. You will not be an expert. We are going to give you a lot of information. You're going to hear a lot about species ID, a lot about beach etiquette, and it might be really overwhelming and that's okay. You don't have to memorize everything. Um, the more that you do it, the more it will kind of become second nature. You're not there to be an expert. Um, so that's okay if you don't know everything. Um, but yes, and then we are just asking that you do attend um, all of the trainings if you do in fact want to be out on the beach. This is open to the public. So if you're just watching for your own education, that's totally fine. Um, we hope that you will join us out on the beach. But if you do want to be out on the beach, we do ask that you do all of the trainings um, just so that we can make sure that you are prepared. Um, but we're really trying to foster um, a kind of care within our community by going out and educating folks. It's like if you can tell a story about an organism or just make a meaningful connection with someone, it no longer becomes just a sea star or just a muscle or just a clam, um, they'll have that memory and they will, you know, hopefully take that with them and be more careful in their interactions later on. All right. And with that, beach stewards are going to be interacting with the public. Yes. Um, so just a couple notes on that. So beach stewards is not a policing or enforcement body, we are not there to go out and tell people you're doing this wrong. Um, we don't want to shame people. We're not like an enforcing thing. We're an educational resource. Um, so just keeping that in mind um, and just use your discretion when you're, when you're dealing with folks. You're going to be provided with a park ranger's contact information in the hopefully very unlikely event that somebody is just like very blatantly not following beach etiquette if they're just like dumping their motor oil you know if something like really really like flagrant is happening um the beach or excuse me the park rangers do want to know about that so you will have their contact information because um, they want to keep track of things like that and then as mentioned before you will not be an expert it takes years to be a professional beach naturalist or a professional beach interpreter um, so it is okay to say i don't know you will if you are interacting with the public, you will be presented with questions that you don't know the answer to. And that is okay. It's okay to say, I don't know. And you will be provided, if not with the information, you will at least be provided with how to get that information and you can give them that. You can say, I don't know the answer, but this is where you might find that information or here, look at this resource. Um, yeah. And then in addition to that, we are kind of practicing the principle leave no trace and leave no trauma. So leave no trace is kind of common. Just make sure that you leave things the way that they are. Um, you know, leave the beach the way that you found it and also leave no trauma. And this is just in the spirit of inclusion and equity. Um, so we want to take inclusion as seriously as we take conservation. And we want to do our part to make sure that people feel welcomed at the beach. And then especially some COVID considerations, even though the vaccine is more widely available and some of us might be vaccinated already, we are still in the middle of a pandemic and not everybody um, is vaccinated or has access to the vaccine yet. So we do just wanna be mindful of that. So be mindful of different comfort levels with COVID. Um, you know, if you might be really comfortable or you might not be really comfortable, um, if you're approaching people and they're like backing away from you is probably not personal. You know, they're probably just like pretty COVID conscious. So just keeping that in mind, if you are interacting with people, um, especially families, because I don't believe children under the age of 16 have the vaccine yet. So just keeping that in mind. Um, we do ask that you stay masked when you're out there and follow CDC guidelines. So six feet apart. Um, 
again, even if you're vaccinated, we are in a sense, we're represent like we're representing North Sound stewards and representing resources in the MRC and we're working in conjunction with the state parks. So we do just wanna make sure that we're following those guidelines and also work within your own comfort level. Don't feel like uh, you have to do more than you're comfortable with. So if somebody is close to you, you don't have to, you know, you can take whatever space you feel like you need to take because your safety is the number one priority. We wanna make sure that everybody is comfortable. Now we are about to move on to ties and tile, but before we do that, we're going to stop really quick and I'm going to drop a poll. If you have been attending the intertidal monitoring trivia, then you might know the answer to this. So I'm going to launch a poll here. And if you don't, these are questions that you will hopefully know the answer to by the end of this um, training or by the end of like the series of training. So first question, which of these is not considered a, a Nidarian? I've actually never pronounced that word, a Nidarian. So go ahead and fill out your answers. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll close it five, four, three, two, one. All right, we had a 50-50 split. So half of you guys thought sea cucumber, half of you guys thought brain coral. And the correct answer is a sea cucumber. A sea cucumber is an echinoderm, echinoderm. Um, so they are actually not cnidarians. The brain coral is. Okay. So with that, I am going to turn off my screen share here for a second. We're gonna move on to tides and intertidal. I'm going to turn that off and you are going to hear from Alex again. Yes, this is Alex again. And as I said before, I am a member of the MRC. Uh, also, I am retired now from working at Padilla Bay Reserve, which is a, a research and education facility down in Skagit County. And I have a master's degree in environmental education as well. And I'm telling you that not because I want you to think I'm smart, but I want you to know that I am a, a lifelong learner and I am looking forward to learning from you and your expertise as well. I also wanted to just briefly give my perspective on the purpose of this program. Our motivation, I believe, is really to save the beach. You already heard about the love it to death idea. And in fact, many years ago, when I was working at Padilla Bay, I heard a story that at um, Deception Pass one day in the spring, this huge number, I think it was like 13 or 17 school buses, just coincidentally all arrived at the beach the same day at the same time. It was an exceptionally low tide uh, during school hours. And by the end of the day, the beach was so damaged that it was obvious to everyone that something had to change. One of the things that I also experienced at Padilla Bay, a research facility, we did some research on uh, the beach at Padilla Bay at Bayview State Park. And we found uh, scientists measure the health of an ecosystem by measuring the diversity. That's the number of different types of species that are present there. The larger the number, the more healthy that ecosystem is. And we found in research that as we moved down the beach away from the state park, the farther we got, the higher the diversity was. So that was an indication to us that the uh, presence of people coming to the beach actually was uh, diminishing diversity and, and reducing the, the habitat's health. Again, I, I want to point out, as was said before, that we're not to be beach police. We know that that doesn't work. Telling people what to do is, is not going to work, we find. But we do know that the people that come to the beach have a tremendous amount of curiosity and a desire and, uh, and an interest in the beach. And so our goal is to provide education about these organisms and 
also about how our behavior will impact those organisms. And we're then using that as a back door so that as uh, we find that as their curiosity increases, it increases their love and appreciation of the habitat and of the organisms. And then a soft reminder of the destructive ramifications of our behavior will hopefully um, result in involuntary compliance, that people want to do the right thing. So the pressure is off for us. We are not police. Uh, we are educators. And uh, now I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit uh, about the tides. And I, I, the reason we're bringing up the tides, oh, don't bring that up yet, uh, Destiny. I'll let you know when we're ready for that. I'm sorry. Um, the reason that we want to look at the tides is because uh, it. I want to. I want you to understand how the tides are related to this work. Um, first of all, you probably already know that the tides are influenced by celestial bodies, the alignment of the Earth, and the Sun and the Moon. But uh, tides are also affected by the weather. Now the celestial positions are quite predictable, long in advance. Scientists can tell you exactly oh, the relationship between the Earth and Saturn, for instance, or the Earth and the Moon, uh, hundreds of years ago or hundreds of years in the future. But the weather is not predictable. So there are times when we'll go to the beach and we might find that the tide that we experienced that day is different than what was predicted. Now, there are two different formats that we use to, uh, to find the predictions. There are tables and graphs. All the data comes from NOAA. That's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the science agency at the federal government. Uh, now, we can access this data in books. And there are also free apps that you can get on your phone, or you can go to the NOAA webpage, and there are other websites as well. I always use the NOAA webpage. So if you have questions about how to access the tide, I can help you uh, learn how to use the NOAA webpage. I don't know anything about the apps, so you'll have to look somewhere else for that. But uh, if you want to know, uh, if you have any questions about the tides, please contact me, email, telephone, uh, whatever, and, and I would be glad to get on the line with you and, and walk you through it. Now, these resources that I'm showing you today, I did get them from the NOAA webpage, so you'll see what that looks like. Now, the tide is a big wave that travels across the ocean, and that wave will run into the west coast of North America. It enters the Salish Sea out at Cape Flattery, and eventually that wave will roll past uh, Port Townsend and then up uh, north along the shoreline and eventually come to Whatcom County. So the, the high tide at Port Townsend will happen at a different time than it happens at Whatcom County. So if you're using a tide table or some a book or something like that, you'll have to be sure that you have the tide for your area or the corrections. So if you have a book of tides at Port Townsend, you look in the back of the book and it'll say, well, you have to add an hour and a half or whatever it is to, to learn what the tide will be like in Whatcom County. Uh, um, Destiny, you can pull that slide, first slide up for me now. She's pulling up a, a, a tide table. Remember, there are two different ways to predict the tides or to see the predictions, and one is a table and the other is a graph. They both have advantages, but here you can see it. Uh, the table is just a bunch of numbers. Destiny, if you could use your arrow to go down. Whoops, wait a minute. I have to fix something on my computer here. Hold on just a minute. Okay, go down the left hand side of that table and you'll see that those are the dates. Uh, I, I can't remember which month. Oh, it was February. You can see that uh, February 21st and down to February 28th. And uh, across the top of the slide or of, of the table, you can see there are high tides 
listed. And then over further to the right, there are the low tides. You can see that on the 21st, on Sunday the 21st, there were two high tides, one at 314 in the morning and one at 1025 or, uh, in, in, in the morning. And then there were two low tides that day as well one at 6.44 in the morning and one at 6.58 in the evening. Now, uh, the tides you can see are, the height of the tide is measured in feet. So on the Sunday, the 21st, the high tide was 7.5 feet. Now we have to remember that the tide is a wave. So that if you're, if you're in one place in the ocean and that wave goes by, you will go up and down on that wave. And so it's measuring the height of that wave going up from zero and, and back down. Um, and it measures that height in feet. Uh, let's see, I don't think there's anything else there on the table. Let's move on to the next one, Destiny. This, is, this will be showing you a graph of the tides for a whole month. I told the website at NOAA to show me a graph of the tides from the first of the month of August 1st, way over on the left, you'll see August 1st. We have time across the bottom and then all the way over on the right, you'll see the tide for August 30th. Now, again, on the left-hand side, we have the height of the tide measured in feet. Um, and so this is uh, August of 2021. You can see that in a month, the tide goes up and down quite a bit, which makes it difficult to read. But it, what does show us an important thing here? It shows us that in a month, we have some tides that go really low and other tides that don't go quite so low. So around the uh, August 9th, in the first quarter of the, of the month, we've got really low tides. And you can imagine, um, uh, it's called a spring tide when it's going really low like that. It's not related to the season, but I remember it because if you can imagine uh, a weight on a spring and it bounces way down and then back up, that's, that's a spring tide. Now, a little bit further, another week later in the month, you've got low tides that aren't going quite so low. And those are called neap tides. And then a week later, we have another set of spring tides. And then almost at the end of the month, we have another set of neap tides. Now, I don't know what neap means. It comes from Old English. Maybe there was somebody that said, I, it's just a little neap of a tide or something like that. So maybe that's where it got started. Now, the spring tides happen when the earth the moon and the sun are all in a straight line so that those gravitational pulls accentuate each other. The neap tides happen at the first quarter and the third quarter when the moon is at a, a right angle to the sun. And so those gravitational pulls are uh, contrary to each other. So early in the month of August, we have new moon and then first quarter and then full moon, and then third quarter later in the month. You can show the next graph now. Now this is a graph of the tides for one day. So it's a little bit easier to read. It's August 20th this year. Uh, on the very far left, you, we've got the height in feet again. And, uh, and then across the bottom is time. So on the far left, we have midnight on the start of the day. In the middle, we have 12 noon. And then on the far right, we have midnight, the end of, of August 20th. Now it shows as, uh, as is always the case in, um, in the Salish Sea, we have two high tides and two low tides every day, but one low tide is lower than the other low tide. So that's called the low low. The one that's not so low is called the high low. And the same with the high tides. There's a low high tide 
and a high, high tide. Now, if you take the low, low tides for all the days for 10 years and average them out, they call that zero. That's where we, that's the baseline. So we measure that as zero. And if you have a low tide that's one foot higher than that, then you'll have a one foot tide. Now, if it's an average, that means there must be some tides that are lower than zero. And those are called minus tides. So if it's one foot lower than zero, one foot lower than the average, then that would be a minus one foot tide. Now on this day in August that we're looking at, you'll see that zero tide is right at the bottom of the graph. And the lowest low tide is higher than the average. It's actually labeled right there. Maybe you can see it. It says 1.7. That's one, almost two feet above the average. So that's not a very low tide. That's a neap tide. Uh, let's see. Oh, and there's one more thing I want to point out. We're measuring the height of the tide in feet. And then it says MLLW. That stands for mean lower low water. So that's the average low, low tide. And you'll, you'll always see that when you're looking at, uh, at tides. We can move on now to the next graph. Seven days later, now we have a spring tide. Uh, Destiny, can you show where the zero tide is? It's close to the bottom there. Yeah, it's that line right there. And you can see that we have our at our, our spring tide is going below zero. In fact, it's a minus 1.78 feet, almost two feet below the average. Um, so this is, a, this is a good minus tide, a good time to go to the beach. So for instance, how long is that tide below zero? Well, you can see it drops below zero at about eight o'clock in the morning, and it stays below zero until afternoon. So from eight o'clock in the morning till noon, you're gonna have a great low tide, good tide to, uh, to go to the beach, and you'll be able to see lots of exciting animals. And then the next graph, please, Destiny. Now this is showing the lowest tide of the year. I happen to know that every year in the Salish Sea, our lowest low tide is usually in June. So I went and looked and I found it on June 25th. We have a tide here that's a minus 3.45 feet. That's three and a half feet below average. That's a good low tide. Uh, over the 30 years that I was working at Padilla Bay, I remember one year when we had a minus tide of almost four feet. And our highest high tides are usually at about 10 feet. And so the difference between the lowest low and the highest high in this part of the world, or in, in Bellingham, is about 14 feet. Now, this low tide right in the middle of the day has great significance for us in this program. One thing is that we have to remember that these are underwater animals. So it's a problem for them to have the water go away two times every day. They're exposed in, on this lowest low tide of the year. They're exposed to the hot sun of the summer right in the middle of the day. In, in the middle of the warmest time of the year as well. And so they get dried out and they get exposed to tremendous uh, variations. Uh, just as one example, the heat of the water is related to the dissolved oxygen. So oxygen is dissolved in the water. Now there's not nearly as much oxygen dissolved in water as there is in the atmosphere. So it's easy for us to get our oxygen. But if I go out and run around the block, I'm going to come back <laughs> breathing like this to get more oxygen. Now these, uh, it, it, it just so happens that as water warms up, 
the oxygen will leave the water. So these animals have to be adapted to this reduced oxygen. Well, then we go there, we turn over the rocks, we grab onto them, we chase them around with our fingers and they have to run, they have to go and, and they're afraid. They're think, they think you're gonna eat them. And so they're, <laughs> but there's less oxygen for them. So this is an example of, of why we have to be careful and gentle with them. They are very stressed at this time, these low tides. And uh, we want to be careful and gentle with them so we don't make matters worse. Of course, with the sun, you've got evaporation, you have changes in salinity, and other uh, uh, aspects of the water chemistry are going to change. And so it's a very stressful time. These animals are adapted to that. They all have adaptations. They're, they have evolved to live in this place. But this is a stressful time for them. Uh, one interesting thing is that higher in the tide zone, the animals are exposed for a much longer period of time. If you're an animal that lives up at the, you can see on that graph where the 7.5 feet is. If you're an animal that lives up there, you're only underwater for a very short time of the day. So, and they're exposed for a long period of time. So those organisms are more hardy than the animals that are way down low. So the shore crabs, the barnacles, the snails that we find higher in the tide zones are more hardy and we can, uh, we can feel safer handling them and, uh, and, and, and playing with them and observing them without causing so much stress to them because they are more hardy. Next graph, Destiny, if you can move on to the highest tide of the year. I happen to know that the highest tides happen in January in Bellingham Bay. And here you can see the highest tide this year was almost 10 feet high. That's a very high tide. Uh, now, just to point out, this is a spring tide day. We have a very high tide, but look at that way at the far left hand, we have a minus 2.23 tide, very low tide. Be a great time to visit the beach, except it's in the middle of the night. So uh, that's a time when the animals are exposed to extreme cold, which they're usually protected from because they're underwater. But in this case, they're exposed then. But they don't get so many visitors then. So we'd, we're not gonna send you to the beach on January 13th. But these very, very high tides are what are called king tides. And you'll see uh, advertising for us to go out and observe the king tides to see what's happening to the beach because that's a simulation for what sea level rise is going to look like. Now, remember that I said that the tides are also affected by the weather. So here we have these very high tides in the winter. We also have severe storms in the winter. The wind, the uh, air pressure can affect the tides and make a high tide even much higher. Of course, you know about in hurricanes, that's a weather event, and that can cause these you, you sometimes you hear of 10, 20, 30 foot tidal surges. And of course, that's very devastating. We don't have hurricanes here, but we do have severe winter storms. And these high tides can be very devastating uh, because of the storms. So that's something we have to look out for. The uh, next slide is a diagram. So we saw a table. We've seen graphs, and now another scientific portrayal is a diagram. This is a diagram of the tide zones. So you can see up there at the top, uh, we have the animals and the part of the beach that are usually exposed and only submerged a little bit. Or actually, the white part up at the top there is called the splash zone. So you'll get splash up there. Animals and plants have to be adapted for living in salt water conditions, uh, but, uh, uh, but they don't uh, get underwater. And then above that, 
we have the terrestrial zone. That's, of course, not a saltwater thing. That's where trees and grasses and parking lots and our lawns and all are. If you put salt water on your lawn, of course, it would kill it. But, but these things on the terrestrial side are very significant because all that stuff ends up washing down to the beach. Sometimes I'm down at the beach and somebody will come up and say, hey, hey what's this? What's that? What, what is this thing? And I look at it and I go, Oh, oh, well, that's, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a Douglas fir cone or, oh, uh, that's a cucumber. It used to be a cucumber or something. We, we do get a lot of terrestrial things down on the beach. Of course, a lot of uh, pollution comes from the terrestrial zone as well. Now, up near the top, I have uh, marked on this diagram the RAC line. That's W-R-A-C-K. So when the tide comes in and out, it acts like a bulldozer and it'll push stuff up the beach and it'll make this pile of dead things up high on the beach. It's very interesting to go look in the RAC because everything that lives out in the deeper water can uh, be pushed up into the rack. So don't ignore that as you're going down to the beach, take a moment to stop and look at the rack to see what, what you can find in there that can be very interesting things. The high tide zone is exposed most of the time, only underwater a little bit. The middle tide zone, half and half exposed, half underwater. And then the low tide zone is only exposed at the very lowest tides, the minus tides. And then of course the subtitle is not exposed. You need, uh, you need scuba gear to go visit that. What's not shown in this picture, uh, the, the problem with this diagram, well, there are two problems that I see. One of them, it's not showing tide pools. When the tide goes out, there could be depressions that, that keep water. And so you can have some organisms that must have water, but they're adapted for living in these tide pools. The other thing that this uh, diagram doesn't show is, is this is a very steep beach that's shown here. And you will never go to that beach because if you did, you'd fall in the water. We go to beaches that are more shallow. So it's, it's, a, it's a long slope. And so uh, the, the tide zones may not be so obvious, but if you stand back and look at the beach in the, the big picture, you'll notice lines because Animals like, let's take a barnacle, for instance, they don't have to be underwater very much. They're adapted for living in that high tide zone and in the splash zone. Uh, but uh, so, so you'll see a line of barnacles across the top. Barnacles can't live down deeper because that's where their predators live. So the barnacles have a lower edge to where they can live. You'll see a line of barnacles. You'll see a line of uh, rock weed, which is an algae that's adapted for living high in the tide zone. You'll see lines uh, of other organisms and, and effects along the beach. So just a quick review. We're looking for a minus tide. Animals are stressed by the tide. We must be gentle and careful. Now, when we get to the beach etiquette part of this show, we'll tell you how to be uh, careful and gentle. Organisms are also particular about where they can survive. So if you're holding something like, let's say you have a rock with barnacles on it, you look down at the beach. If you don't see barnacles, don't put the rock down there. It's the wrong place. Find the place where you took it from or where those organisms, where you see them on the beach to put them back. Uh, you will get to know your beach. For instance, when I was working at Padilla Bay, I know if it was a three foot tide, I knew what would be exposed and I knew what to plan for the people that were coming for an educational program. I knew that I needed a tide above three feet to do a beach seine. I knew I needed a tide below three feet if I was gonna do a mud flat exploration. You will get to know your beach too. So just, uh, just visit frequently and, and, and you'll learn about those horizontal lines and what you're looking for. 
Uh, that's all I have then, Destiny. I, what does the next slide say? All right, well, actually, we are gonna go ahead and take a five minute break. I know we're a little early on the hour, but it's gonna take more than 10 minutes to go over beach etiquette. So I just wanna make sure folks get a break before we jump into that. Um, but before we do, if I can find it, I'm gonna see if I can launch a poll here. Let's go ahead and take a five minute break. We will come back at 6.56. Um, and in the meantime, I will work on pulling up a poll for you guys. So I will see you in five minutes. Thank you. Thanks. Give folks another minute to hop on. Go ahead. And if you were paying attention to the very last slide and you took a look at the organisms that were on the tide table, or not the tide table, but the intertidal zone, then you may know the answer to this. So which of these is a high tide organism? All right, I'm going to give folks a couple more seconds to answer which of these is a high tide organism. All right, okay, so the correct answer is shore crab. Oh, I don't know why it says Wait, when I share the results, I don't know if it says the correct answer is chitin, but the correct answer is a shore crab. So if you got that right, good job. So we're gonna stop sharing that and then we're gonna go back to our presentation and cover some beach etiquette. There we go. All right, so in this section, we're gonna cover beach etiquette and how to be courteous beach goers, not only to the critters and the animals, but also to each other and making sure that we're not loving our beaches to death. Um, a lot of these things are common sense, um, especially it sounds like a lot of you guys have spent a lot of time on the beach. So I'm sure most of you guys know all of this. Um, and for the following things, it's not necessarily that one person doing these things is like really, really detrimental, but we're more concerned that like when a lot of people do it, when we have a lot of people coming to the beach and we're all kind of like doing little things or like taking things from the beach or leaving our trash um, and things like that. When we have a lot of folks doing it, then it becomes a problem. And again, we're gonna be having a lot of folks out, lots of good low tide days, um, especially with COVID. So we do wanna make sure that we are just on top of it so the first thing for beach etiquette is uh, treat critters and algae with care. So these intertidal organisms are very sensitive and they can get damaged. They can die if they're not handled properly um, or carefully. So common sense, just make sure that you are treating um, the animals with care. You wanna carefully um, observe when you can. It's always better to look with your eyes, not with your hands. So whenever possible, you do wanna make sure that you are just observing and appreciating but not necessarily picking up. Um, if you do happen to pick up, just make sure that you are mindful of what kind of products you have on your hands. A lot of us are wearing sunscreen. Um, there are certain types of chemicals. There is oxybenzone and oxytinoxate, um, which a lot of us know are harmful to um, coral reefs, but also just any types of products and chemicals um, uh, the critters might not like that. And even just mineral sunscreens can give off little nanoparticles. So we do just want to make sure that if we're wearing lotions, sunscreens, fragrances, and things like that, just being really mindful and maybe not picking them up if we do um, have products on our hands. All right, so the next thing, like Alex just mentioned, is we do not want to move animals from one tidal zone to the other. Um, if you have a tide pool and oh. I'm gonna stop, it looks like we have a question. Go ahead, Shannon, you are welcome to turn your mic on. With hand sanitizers on our hands, such as we will have, what are we going to do about that when we're picking up stuff? 
Ooh, so if somebody else has a better answer to this, feel free to jump in. Don't quote me on this. I don't think that that's a problem. If you have hand sanitizers on your hand, it'll, um, if you just give it some time, it'll evaporate off of your hands. And I believe it will be fine. If somebody has evidence to the contrary, please tell me, but I do think hand sanitizer is fine. There have been some studies that hand sanitizer, you know, is supposed to kill bacteria on your hands. Guess what? It also kills bacteria in the marine environment as well. Um, so with things like hand sanitizer, um, the recommendation I would go with, Alex, who has many, many more years experience out in the field, so I'll let him chime in if he has something else to say, but I would say definitely use hand sanitizer as you feel like you need it. I would recommend don't put on your hand sanitizer and then directly stick your hands into the tide pool right away, right after you apply it, maybe wait a little bit, let it absorb and um, uh, also evaporate off of your hands a little bit before you do that. Um, you might also be able to like, if you have a, you know, hanky or something like that, that you have out in the field, you might be able to just give a quick wipe before you stick your hands into um, a tidal pool or pick up an organism. But when we're out on the beach, we can also discuss that more. I don't know if Alex had anything he wanted to add. I don't have anything to add. I, want, I do want to remind you that it's okay to say, I don't know. Yes. All right, perfect. Well, thank you, Eleanor, for clarifying that um, because I did not know, but yes. Sounds good, definitely use it as needed, but yeah, just try and be mindful about like the time in between. Um, so yes, for number two, don't move animals from one tidal zone to the other. Like Alex just said, if you see um, a barnacled rock in one area, don't pick it up and move it to an area with rocks without barnacles. Um, different areas of the tide or tide pools can have different temperatures, different salinities and things like that. So we just wanna be really mindful that we are, if we are picking things up, that we are putting them exactly where we found it. We don't wanna move them from one tidal zone to the other. Um, and just for an example, a low tide sea urchin or sunflower star would not survive in the high tide area. So those are these two things pictured. All right. Another little common sense thing is we want to avoid walking on the animals. These are intertidal. These are like, especially the low tide organisms are like right underneath our feet. So making sure we're watching where we're stepping um, when you're walking on rocky shores. You want to try and be in the areas where there aren't as many rocks um, and just like the patches of mud and sand between them. So um, try not to crush barnacles. They are living organisms. Um, and they are alive. So we want to make sure that we are watching where we step. Okay, and another one, please um, gently lift rocks and put them back the way that you found them. Um, turning over rocks, there are lots of organisms that like live underneath the rocks. There could be eggs that you could be crushing um, or disturbing or disrupting if you are moving rocks like super vigorously. So just make sure that you're being really careful when you're turning over the rocks and also just being mindful that some creatures are underneath the rocks because that's where they need to be. That is how they survive. They can be more vulnerable to predators, to sun and air exposure, changes in temperature and things like that. Um, so just, if you see an organism under a rock, leave the rock where it's at. It's there for a reason. Um, and then also just being mindful of things that are living on top of the rocks as well. So just the same that we don't want to disturb anything underneath the rocks. If you see a rock with a barnacle on it, the barnacle is on top. We're not going to take that rock, flip it over and have the barnacle underneath and things like that. And also just for safety reasons, do not lift anything larger than your head. Um, we just don't want you to get hurt. We don't want you to hurt your back. Even if you think that you're young, you know, we just want to be safe and make sure that we are not um, lifting anything larger than our heads and also just being mindful that when we are moving rocks, we are, we can potentially like disrupt the substrate and the sand and we're, if a lot of folks are doing that, we're going to be altering kind of the ecosystem there. So just being mindful about that. Next thing is please be sure to fill any holes. This is especially if we have any clamors. Um, we wanna make sure that we're filling our holes. Um, a lot of animals can die if they are dug out of their holes. Same case in point with the, if the animal's under the rock, it's there for a reason, leave it under the rock. If you see um, animals buried, like burrowed underneath the sand, they're there because that is how they survive. So digging them out makes them more vulnerable. And yes, just please fill your holes. It's better for, leaving our beaches exactly how they were. And also it prevents people from tripping and falling into your holes. We don't want that. So do it for the animals and also do it for each other. 
Right, next thing is something we all know. If you have pets, please control your pets. Um, don't allow your pets to harass the animals. Yes, it can be entertaining, but it is not good for the animals. We do have migratory birds in the area um, and they do need um, periods of just uninterrupted feeding. So we don't want to let our dogs loose and let dogs chase off the birds because that can be harmful to them. Um, we wanna make sure that we are respectful to the wildlife and that we are also making sure our pets are as respectful as possible. So please make sure to control your pets um, and just advise people to control their pets as well. Um, and then we wanna encourage people to pick up their pet waste. Um, pet owner 101, um, you want folks to pick up their pet waste. It can introduce a lot of um, disease causing bacteria into the water if pet waste is allowed to get into the water. Um, owner actually told me that a single dog can shut down 15 acres of a 15 acres? 15 acres of a beach, which is incredibly bad. So one animal can do a lot of damage. So we do just wanna make sure that we are encouraging folks to pick up their pet waste and dispose of it properly in the trash. And I'm sure you'll hear more about pet waste and bacteria um, when we talk about the water quality portion of our training, which is gonna be on day two. Yes, be responsible pet owners and encourage folks to be responsible pet owners. Another one I know we all know is pick up our trash. Um, we wanna make sure that beachgoers are picking up their trash. Um, a lot of marine organisms can mistake it for food, um, which is really harmful and it can entrap um, shorebirds and marine mammals. So common beach etiquette 101, let's pick up our trash, leave no trace as much as we can um, and dispose of things properly. Okay, and then another one here is do not mount, dry, or preserve. Specimens, not only is it altering the ecosystem, it's not good for that, it's also illegal to remove things from the beach um, without a collection permit. So we do just wanna make sure, it can be really tempting if you see something really cool and you're like, oh, wouldn't that be nice to like take that home. We've had people take like sea stars home, which is not good, we, we don't want that. Um, so definitely just like leave things where they are. Um, again, taking creatures, overturning rocks, um, disturbs the ecosystem and the intertidal system. So please, let's not love our beaches to death. We know that they're awesome and that there's a lot of cool like things that you might wanna take home, but um, avoid the urge to take a piece of the beach home. And that is probably one of the, one of the bigger things that you'll run into when you're out there on the beach. So pretty common sense. Um, so just a brief recap. Um, oh, I had a quick question about uh, taking things home. What are, you, what are your opinions on like taking shells and stuff home? Because I know with like snail shells, that's not really good to do because hermit crabs need them, but like clam shells, all that jazz, like what do you think about that? Ooh, I am going to defer to either Eleanor or Alex. <laughs> Yeah, I have a comment about that. All the things on the beach are part of the natural system, even the clam shells and the, and the dead algae. It, it's all part of that natural ecosystem. So it's better for us to leave them there if we can. Thank you. All right, yes. Uh, I'm going to chime in real quick, and it's illegal at the state parks to take anything off of the beach, shells or anything. Yes, thank you for that clarification, yes. And we are gonna be working in the state parks, so do keep that in mind. Um, oh, did we have some, one sec, just check in the chat here. Ah, yes, okay. Yes, thank you, Alex, in case y'all don't know, I am not the resident expert in this, so that's why we have um, Eleanor and Alex here. But yes, just a real brief recap. Um, it kind of all falls under this idea of leave no trace. So leave things to the best of your ability exactly as you found it. We don't want to disturb. So leave no trace, leave no trauma. Again, we wanna be good beachgoers to everybody. Put things back exactly the way you found it. Um, when unsure, if you don't know, it is always better to look with your eyes and not with your hands. When we're on the on the beach portion, you might get some trainings on how to properly handle organisms with care and like know how to pick things up. Um, so you'll have that knowledge, but we definitely want to encourage beachgoers to just admire and not take. Um, and also just err on the side of caution. If you don't know, just 
and be on the safer side. If you don't know, don't pick it up um, with the organisms as well as with COVID. So um, now we are gonna jump into species ID. Um, and this is gonna be, at least for me, I'm not the best species ID person. So I have lots of questions whenever I go through this. So if you have any questions, you are definitely encouraged to either just stop, um, hop off of mute, raise your hand, put them in the chat, just interrupt however you want to. Um, and we will answer those questions for you. And again, it's okay if you don't know everything or if, you, or if you're like, this is really overwhelming, that's totally fine. We're giving you a lot of information. It's gonna be recorded and you're gonna receive all these materials later. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. And then I will go ahead and pass it on to the species ID folks. So I believe you're going to be hearing from Rondi and Alex again. All right, we're going to dive into species identification. This is Eleanor, I don't know. When I share a screen, everything goes weird. Um, so I'm going to be driving the slides, but I'm going to hand things over to Rondi now. Um, Eleanor, yeah. really quick. Um, so I can see the species ID and I can also see the upcoming slide. So I'll, there we go. Perfect. We're good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. uh, Rondi, take it away. So I'm Rondi. I am the AmeriCorps for the Aquatic Reserves. Again, just a quick intro. Um, and I'll be talking about just intertidal habitat, kind of reiterating what Alex talked about before, and then getting into some species ID. Um, just a quick intro, and we'll cover more um, in the next session. Um, and we'll be covering a lot of different species and talking about different ways to identify them, but kind of as Destiny's already talked about, you don't have to memorize all of this, and we'll be sending the notes out too in case you want to review anything. Um, but yeah, so kind of just a quick overview of Haptat. We can go to the next slide. And so this is kind of a similar diagram to what Alex provided, um, kind of the same general idea. Um, we have species broken up into different tide zones where in the high tide, they're either not often exposed to water or they're exposed to a lot of periods or longer periods of dry. Um, where they're exposed to the air more often. And they're pretty well adapted to that. Um, so things like barnacles, limpets, and snails, they have really hard shells where they can kind of close up um, and keep the water and moisture in and the cold or hot um, dry air out. Um, and things like shore crabs, they often hide under rocks and in damp places. And so they really know where to go or they know how to move and change their bodies. Um, and then in the mid-tide zone, you see things that um, maybe are pretty well adapted, but not quite as much. So things like a chitin that has um, its hard plates, but is still a little bit exposed around the plates. Or something like a sea star that doesn't really have a hard shell, but really knows how to get into the tight crevices um, and where to hide under rocks and things. Um, and then as you get a little lower into the tide zone, you find things that are little more soft bodied, things that have gills like fish, um, or creatures that just really prefer habitat that's further out in the subtidal zone. Um, things like sea urchins or um, decorator crabs, different things like that. I see there's a comment um, asking if surf grass is the same as eel grass. Um, I think for the purpose of this diagram, you could think about it like that. Um, and so this is just another example of a tidal zone diagram. And we can move on to the next slide. The surf grass is a different species than eelgrass, but they are both vascular plants and not algae. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Um, so here's just a quick photo of something that you might see in the upper inner tidal or kind of in the diagram that Alex provided, the um, splash zone or the rack line. Um, so you have barnacles and limpet here, um, and those are critters that have really good shells that keep, as I said before, water in and air out. Um, and so they're going to be pretty well adapted to being exposed to air most of the time and for long durations. Um, you can move to the next slide. Um, here's an example of some creatures that you might find in the middle intertidal zone or kind of like the upper end. 
um, with a chitin, and you can see that it has these um, hard plates. So it kind of has a little bit of a shell almost, but you can see kind of more of a tender, fleshy part around, um, which might be a little more prone to being exposed to air and not really liking it so much. Um, and you also have a photo of a purple sea star. Um, they don't have a hard shell, but they're really good at kind of contorting their bodies to fit into these really tiny crevices or under rocks, places where they know that they can stay damp um, and not dry out. And we can move to the next slide. And then we get to lower intertidal areas where we find um, um, things like this tide pool sculpin that's hiding in eelgrass. Um, and so things like fish, they <laughs> really need to stay in water. And so you can find them often in tide pools as this tight pool sculpin is named. You can also often find them in those areas, or you can find them a little further out in areas that are damp, like um, eelgrass beds where it's gonna be nice and wet, um, or kind of in areas that may not be entirely exposed to um, the air quite yet. Um, kind of a similar thing for creatures like nudibranchs, like the sea lemon depicted in the lower right. Um, they're very soft bodied and they can get a little goopy looking if they're too exposed to the air, like if it's kind of hanging onto a rock and it's totally out in the open, it can be a little hard to identify sometimes like that. Um, but then you also have species that just prefer to be further out, like the sunflower star. Um, its habitat is more often in the subtitle zone, so you're not going to see them very often, but they're really cool to know about. Um, we can move to the next slide. And so I believe this is something that Eleanor is going to go over. Yeah. Um, so for this one, I stopped sharing screen, right? <laughs> Sometimes yeah. I <laughs> OK, <laughs> thanks. Um, so uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, species ID and expectations. And then I'm going to hand it over to Alex for a fun little beach taxonomy song exercise. But um, for starters, um, I guess I'm really excited when we did all of the, um, the the icebreaker where everyone introduced themselves and their favorite critter and things like that. It sounds like um, some of you have some past experience, which is really great and helpful. Um, but the really the main thing that you need for this is just like excitement. And so um, from doing this in the past, you know, you could know everything out there and know how to ID everything down to a species level and, you know, write huge scientific papers. But that doesn't mean that you're necessarily a great beach interpreter. Like people might not want to hear a dissertation on how the um, barnacle, this particular barnacle is found where it is. Um, but they might want to hear from you guys um, if you're excited about it. Um, even if it's just like, here's the difference between a barnacle and a limpet. Like, if you tell it in a good, exciting way and you're passionate about it, people definitely want to listen. Um, so what we're, we're going to dive a little bit more into species identification. We've um, included species that um, are more commonly found at Larrabee State Park and uh, Birch Bay State Parks. Um, there's, it's definitely not a full, complete list. Um, but, and we don't always go down to species level. I don't think we need to do that, um, but we highlighted the common ones that you'll find. Um, we'll also try to incorporate a little bit more, um, not necessarily like how do you ID this particular kind of crab, but like other fun things about crabs um, that might be a little bit more interesting and some of the common questions that come up. Um, and uh, as Destiny mentioned, we will provide um, some supplemental materials. So for those of you who want to dive deeper, you can go for it. Those materials will be there, but you're not expected to necessarily have to dive deeper. Um, so we're hoping that everything that we teach you in this Zoom and out on the beach will help prepare you um, to go out on your own and talk to folks on the beach. Um, and <laughs> this is a program that we're reviving. So it's, I think, ever evolving. And so um, if you have questions along the way, feel free to ask because there's some chance that we might have forgotten something. Um, 
and you know everything's weird with covid too <laughs> and so i wish we could do this um in person and it would be great to be um working more face to face with everyone but um at least we got to go out on the beach um safely distanced and masks and all of that um so i'm excited for that but um just to rehash real quick um don't feel like you need to take tedious notes on every single little thing that we say we will also share the recording as well as the presentation slides that will have notes along with those as well um and so with that um unless there's any questions i'm going to pass it off to alex for the beach taxonomy song Okay, I don't see any questions, so I'm going to move ahead with taxonomy. Taxonomy is the way that scientists group things together. So uh, when we see a variety of organisms and, and oh, these, all these organisms over here have these characteristics and all these ones over here have those characteristics, so, so they come up with uh, from ways of grouping these things. There are several reasons why taxonomy is helpful. And one of them is because of uh, several uh, uh, ideas that we've already mentioned for you to communicate with others. It's important to be able to say, I don't know. And the reason, one of the reasons that that's important is because I have found that if somebody brings something and they say, what's that? And you give it a name, then they say, okay, and they're done with it. And, but if you, if they bring it to you and, and they say, what's that? And then you say, well, oh, look at that. Look at that part right there. What do you think that's for? Or where did you find that? Have you ever seen another animal like that on land? If, if, you, if you tie things together that way, you'll increase their observations. It's a great way for you to learn about the animals, to look at them first. For instance, we had that question earlier, which of these four animals is uh, a Nidarian or whatever the question was? Well, right away, my mind said, oh, well, that one has tube feet. So that's not a Nidarian because tube feet are the characteristics of echinoderms. I just, and once you learn these characteristics, it becomes easier for you to learn about the animals. Also, if you see something on the beach and, you, and you, you're able to put it, let's say you see something, you don't know what it is and you wanna look it up in a book or look for it on the internet, it's gonna help you if you know what category it comes from because you then you'll know which part of the book to look in. Uh, just as an example, crustaceans, all crustaceans have the same characteristics of an exoskeleton, two pairs of feelers, they have jointed legs, uh, and uh, I can't remember, maybe there's something else. But uh, this song, that I have starts out with talking about a crustacean. Uh, the part of the crab exoskeleton that is the biggest piece that you see is called the carapace. And you will hear us talk about the carapace of crabs because uh, it's an important part of, uh, of learning about crabs. Uh, so in this song, the first line describes a crustacean, carapace, jointed legs, two pairs of feelers, eyes on pegs. Has anybody seen my... And then there's a one syllable word that fits right in there. Carapace, jointed legs, two pairs of feelers, eyes on pegs. Has anybody seen my... Now, if you want to guess what it is, raise your hand. Who wants to guess what this animal is? Anybody want to raise their hand for that? Mm, nobody's going to take a chance, huh? All right. Well, then just think of the answer in your mind, and I'm going to go through the song. 
and, and it's got other uh, categories of, of taxonomy as well. Carapace, jointed legs, two pairs of feelers, eyes on pegs. Has anybody seen my crab? Echinoderm, tube feet are fine. Gastropods can walk on slime. But tell me if you see my crab. An estuary is full of creatures sublime, but there is one that makes me smile all the time. Bivalves have two shells that shut. Nudibranch gills are naked, but tell me if you see my, has anybody seen my, everybody has seen my crab, coochie, coochie, coo. Now, oh, thank you. <laughs> now, there's another thing that that song is about, and that is that there's something magical about crabs. You take kids to the beach, and they might find worms, they might find snails, but when they find a crab, if they're a hundred feet down the beach, you'll know it because there's something special about crabs. If you want to hear the song again, we are recording this presentation and you'll be able to go back to it. And uh, there's also a, a version of it on YouTube and I'm going to put the link to that YouTube in the chat right now. And so uh, you'll have it and you can go lit, hear it again. Is that the end of my turn, Eleanor? I believe so, unless you had anything else. No, I can't think of anything else right now. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for that. And um, anyone who felt like all of a sudden, oh no, am I going to have to audition for a Broadway musical? Don't worry. <laughs> you don't have to sing out on the beach. But if you feel comfortable and that's something you're interested in, I wouldn't stand in your way. Um, it's always fun having songs and different ways of learning like that. So thank you for sharing that, Alex. And um, we will share out that link so that folks can go back to that if they want to um, look at it again and um, help them remember how to like differentiate some of that um, taxonomy. So I will pass it off to or back to Rondi now. Thanks for the song Glenn or Alex. I, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to commute with that for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> hard, hard competition out here. Um, so for the rest of the species ID section, we're going to talk about anemones and echinoderms. So talking about anemones, they kind of look a little funky, a little alien-like, maybe a little plant-like, kind of like a flower, um, but they're actually predatory animals. Um, they're really cool, and we're going to talk a little bit more about them um, and different species and ways to look for them. Um, some fun facts about them, or maybe just go back. Um, some fun facts would be um, that they actually have like little stingers or um, hooks that they can send out um, called nematocysts. Um, and that's how they catch food on their tentacles. Um, and so also when they're exposed to low tide, they'll pull the little flowery parts in to conserve water. So we can go to the next slide. And so one of the more common species that you're gonna find are aggregating anemones. Um, and they're gonna be typically green on the outside with pink tips. So it's like they dyed the tips of their hair all nice and pink. They're kind of going through a phase or getting a little artsy hair. Um, and they're called aggregating anemones because they um, are typically found in these clusters. Um, and that's because they actually clone themselves. And so these clusters are pretty genetically similar or even identical. Um, and as they grow, they'll kind of grow out in different spaces and the aggregates get bigger. But if they start to encroach on each other, they'll actually kind of fight each other for territory. And this can be called like a clone war and it forms like a no man's land in between. Um, but they're really common and you'll probably see them a lot. Um, here you see kind of how they look when they're out and when they're also pulled in. So we can go to the next slide. 
Another common species would be the burrowing anemone, which is also called the moon glow anemone. Um, and these you'll typically find further out kind of in the sand burrowed in. Um, and they're often in colors of like this bright green or kind of a luminous gray. And they're typically identified by the white bands on their tentacles. Um, they're really cool to see out on a night walk. So as Alex mentioned, um, sometimes you'll have these really nice low tides, but they're at night. Um, and sometimes people do go out. I've gone out before um, and they're really pretty in the moonlight. Um, maybe that's how they get their name. Um, next slide. And so plumos anemones are another kind. Um, I think there's supposed to be another photo here. I'm not sure where it went. Um, oh, there we go. Yeah, that's, that's the nicer one. Um, they're not really much to show for um, at a low tide, but once they're submerged underwater, or if you catch them kind of at a point in the tide where they're underwater, they show this really delicate kind of feathery or lacy plumage on them, which is how they get their name. Um, and you'll, as kind of in the photos, you'll kind of see them attach to the undersides of rocks. And so we can go to the next slide. Painted anemones are another one that you'll see. Um, and kind of in the photo where the people are like pointing and looking in that crevice in the rock. Um, apparently there's one at Larrabee State Park that's been observed for, there for as long as a hundred years. So apparently they're pretty long lived creatures and they're pretty easily identifiable by their sort of painted almost Christmas colored. Um, yeah, yeah, so I see a comment from Lucy Greeley. Um, they're also called Christmas anemones, um, same kind um, because of their red and green color. And sometimes here in the Pacific Northwest, they'll take on a fully red color. Um, but so if you're gonna be um, out at Larrabee, try, maybe try and see um, if you can find where this one is. And that'll be a really fun way to talk to people about anemones. We can go to the next slide. And so now we're gonna talk a little bit about echinoderms. And so as Alex also mentioned, they're the little things with the tube feet. So if you've ever turned over a sea star and looked at all the wiggly kind of um, suction cup looking things on the bottom, those are called tube feet. And they're kind of like a whole bunch of little legs. Um, and so sea stars, sea cucumbers, sand dollars, and sea urchins are all falling under this um, taxonomy. And so we can go to the next slide. And so one of the main critters that we'll find under the echinoderm section are sea stars. And so we can move on to the next slide. And one of the main sea stars that we'll find are the purple ones, so Pisastro acretius. Um, they're kind of the classic sea star we have in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and a fun fact is that they're not all purple. Um, kind of in the photo that you see here, they can be pink, or they can also come in shades of like different kinds of purple, different pinks, oranges, and so much more. Um, and so sometimes, as we'll find with um, marine critters, if there's a color in the name, that's not always going to be true. So we have to kind of think about other factors that come into identification. Um, and so when looking for a purple sea star, you can kind of look at it for like the bumpy white texture and kind of the soft, fuzzy colored parts um, and looking at the size of the legs and other features about them. Um, so you can kind of see purple sea stars are a little bit chunky sometimes and um, they're also pretty good at cramming themselves into rocks and damp places. Um, so those are some of the best places to find them um, under rocks and in crevices that are nice and moist at low tides. And we can move to the next one. Rondi, really quick, it looks like we have a question from Catherine. Is there still a lot of sea star wasting syndrome? Um, so I think I'll let Eleanor answer that question since she has participated in some of the sea star surveys that go on. Yeah, so I would say sea star wasting syndrome is not hitting, it's not hitting the Pacific Northwest as bad as it was several years ago. However, we, and we are seeing bounces back in certain sea star species, but not all of them. Some were hit harder than others. And so 
Um, I would, we do sea star surveys out at um, Neptune Beach at um, Cherry Point, which is just a little south of Birch Bay State Park. And it seems like the populations have been bouncing back there. Up until recently, we were doing them also at Point Whitehorn um, Park, also at Cherry Point, also just south of Birch Bay. And um, those populations seem to have bounced back a bit too. Um, I know that there's also sea star wasting syndrome surveys done at Larrabee State Park, but I haven't looked at the data um, specifically for that area. Um, the sunflower stars uh, seem to have been hit a lot harder than a lot of the other species. Um, and so it has been, I think I've seen one sunflower star in the last like five, six, seven, eight years or so. Um, and that was actually at uh, just south of Birch Bay State Park at a really low negative tide. Um, so there are still some out there and there's actually ongoing research right now um, looking at uh, how um, we might be able to help reintroduce populations of sea stars um, or sun stars. Uh, folks might have seen some of the uh, recent news article headlines with um, some of that research and it looks like they are able to breed them in captivity, at least so far. Um, they ha have had some success, so there's some hope out there. Um, but we do still look out for it. And um, we will be doing a survey actually on May 27th at Neptune Beach out at Cherry Point. Um, and if folks are interested in more information on that, I can, I'll include that with the supplemental material so you can see kind of what it, what it involves and how you can tell whether or not um, a sea star has wasting syndrome. And you can also always snap a photo and there's a place where you can report it online because even if it's a healthy star, um, they still wanna know so that if they do see um, wasting syndrome pop up, they know the last time um, healthy stars were observed. Alex, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanna put in a plug for another event called What's the Point, which is happening on that same date that you just mentioned, the 27th. And they're uh, going to have an online Zoom event. And one of the participants is going to be at the Sea Star monitoring site and talking about that with the scientists. So if you uh, look for What's the Point, you can't find it contact me and I'll get you connected up. I'm going to put my email address in the chat right now. So if anybody has questions about that, they'll be able to find me. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. I'm also helping to coordinate that event. Um, and so if um, you're looking for more ways to get involved with it, um, feel free to email me as well. Um, but moving right along, um, I'm going to start talking about the modeled star. Um, they're often kind of mistaken for um, the purple sea star, but they can be distinguished from them by kind of their little narrower, more skinny arms and kind of their more modeled, less uniform color. Um, similar to the purple stars, they do come in a wide variety of colors, um, kind of seen in these photos, ranging from kind of like a blue orange to like a dark green. Um, they're really interesting, um, but they're different from the purple sea stars. Um, but also very common. So we can move to the next slide. Um, the giant pink sea star, I think is a little more true to its color name from what I've heard. They're typically more reliably a pink or light purple. Um, and they're actually from the same genus as the purple sea star. Um, and they look really similar, um, but they can be kind of distinguished more by their slightly less fuzzy looking texture. Um, and so I'm not sure how frequently they're seen, but it's something that's good to know how to ID from some of the other sea stars that you might find out, out on the beach. The next slide. And the six rayed sea, sea star um, can be a little bit tricky sometimes. So if you're not really paying attention to how many rays or arms a sea star has, you might just think, oh, that's just a purple sea star. Oh, that's just a model star. But sometimes if you see something that looks a little bit different or like a little bit off and you're like, hmm, what is that? It looks a little bit weird. And you count the rays, it might have six. 
and most sea stars, they have five. And you're like, oh, is that, is that sea star okay? And it probably is. It's probably just a six rayed star. Um, and they're also sometimes called brooding sea stars because they'll kind of take care of their babies and they'll actually have their um, six arms wrapped around the eggs and you can sometimes see the babies around the adults. Um, so they're really cool and kind of funky. Um, really a treat to see if you find one. And we can go to the next slide. And leather stars are also a fun one. Um, they're a little easy to identify. Um, they have a pretty true, true to a name star shape. Um, their arms aren't quite as long and bendy um, and they have kind of a mottled coloration on them. But one of, one of my favorite facts about them is that some people say if you sniff them, like if you hold it up to your face like this person is, they smell like garlic. So if you're not sure what it is, always good to smell it, I suppose. Um, but kind of looking at this photo too, I would like to note that um, generally when you're looking at sea stars, um, be careful with how you handle them. Um, like if you see one really tightly attached to a rock, don't rip it off. Um, that's really bad. Um, their tube feet are basically suction cupped on to stay on and that's how they kind of deal with tides and waves moving around and how they stay in places that are like suitable for low tide. Um, so just being careful and mindful of, okay, this creature is staying here, it wants to be here, so let's not move it and force it off of somewhere that it chose to be. Um, but I'm assuming this leather star was probably just laying in the sand. Um, we can move to the next slide. And so moving on from sea stars, we also find sand dollars on the beach, um, pretty predictably in sand. Um, so kind of moving away from some of the more rocky areas along the beach where, where you'll find sea stars, when you move a little further down, kind of towards the mid or low intertidal, you'll sometimes encounter um, sand flats. Um, and so it's important to, even though we kind of mentioned when you're rock walking around the intertidal um, to not walk or step on rocks that have barnacles. Also pay attention to the sand that you're walking in. Sometimes there will be sea stars in there or um, sand dollars. And so sometimes they'll be pretty you know, visible on the surface, but sometimes they'll also be kind of burrowed in or just kind of sticking out from really odd angles. Um, and they can blend in with the sand really well sometimes, um, especially when they're alive in the darker color. Um, and so one common question that I've heard and one that I had when I was a kid was, you know, why are some white and why are some darker colored? Like, what's the difference and how do you know which ones are live or dead? Um, and kind of looking closely at the picture on the left, you can see kind of little, like, it almost looks a little fuzzy. Um, and so those are actually its two feet how it moves around and maneuvers through the environment. Um, and if it has the two feet, it's alive. Um, but if it's pale, um, doesn't have the two feet, it might be dead. Um, but sand dollars are really fun. Um, and you can find them in the sand flats kind of around where you might find eelgrass too. And so we can move to the next slide. Um, and so sea cucumbers, they're also a kind of germs. Um, I believe that was maybe from one of the poll questions. Um, and so they also have two feet. Um, and they're, they're like really soft bodied, even, even more so than some of the sea stars. And so they, they really like to stay moist and wet. They don't like being out in the sun or out in the sand. Um, so you'll probably find them in pools, like tide pools or um, in nice, cool, damp places under rocks. Um, yeah, I think we can move to the next slide. And sea urchins, um, one of the more common species here in the Salish Sea would be the green sea urchin. Um, they're normally found a little further out in the intertidal, like the lower zone or even subtidal areas, um, kind of out where the sunflower stars are and where um, bull, kelp, bull kelp is. Um, they like to eat the kelp and the sunflower stars like to eat the urchins. Um, and they're really cool. Um, those arms are also kind of thought to be, or they, they're like their legs, their two feet. Um, you're not likely to see them, but they're also really fun to learn about. Um, and sometimes you'll find these subtitle creatures washed up a little towards the lower intertidal zone. And 
let's see, is that my last slide? Yeah, that's my last slide. Ran through that a little quick, but we have time for a recap with Destiny, Destiny and um, getting some info for the next session. Yes, all right, thank you, Rondi. I just wanna double check, do we have any more questions from that section before we move on to wrapping it up? All right, perfect. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us this evening for section one of the Beach Stewards training. Um, the next section is gonna be a week from now, same day, Monday, 6 to 8 p.m. again. Um, if you're not already registered for that, you can do that on the resources website or we're gonna be sending a follow-up email. Um, and we'll include the link to register in that email as well. Um, for the next training session, we're gonna be going over a review of day one. So a review of beach etiquette and all of the species ID training that you just received. Um, and then you'll be receiving your each one, teach one assignments for when we go out on the beach um, the following weekend. So you'll be assigned a few organisms to study and kind of like work on your story about them and how to interpret them. And then we'll go out on the beach and kind of interpret to each other. I know we're still kind of acclimating to in-person contact. So there might be like some jitters about like talking to people on the beach. So we'll work through all of that with each other first and make sure that we're all comfortable before we send you guys out into the public. Um, and again, if you're not able to attend this next training session next week, that's totally fine. It's gonna be recorded. And we just wanna make sure that you watch the recording. Um, now, if you can't make it to the beach portion of that, um, we'll be reaching out to folks individually so we will know and we can try and make accommodations for that. Um, again, if you can't make it next week, that's fine. Just be on the lookout for an email for your each one teach one assignment and just make sure that you watch that recording. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? We'll go more in depth about what we're gonna do on the beach in the following training. Yes, please send Zoom info. We will definitely do that. We'll send out the Zoom regis uh, registration link for everybody so we can make sure that you all are signed up. All right. Okay, seeing no questions. Well, thank you for spending your evening with us. I know it's a little late, so thanks for sticking around. Um, we really appreciate it. If you think of any questions in the meantime, I'm going to drop my contact info and also Eleanor's. And between the two of us, we can definitely get whatever questions you have answered. Um, and you can find us on the resources website. You can also reach out to Alex or Rondi, any of the presenters you saw today, and we will get those questions answered for you. But um, with that, I will leave you to your evening. Thank you all for attending. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you.